Today we're talking about the passage from Scripture that Jesus said he is the vine. So bear with me for a moment. Uh, when I joined the Navy, they sent me off to boot camp. Now, I was not 17 or 18. I had finished college, had finished a four-year master's program. Uh, they sent us chaplains, as they called us, uh, to this special boot camp just for us. Now, we were older than the typical 18-year-old. Uh, the oldest, the youngest you could actually be was probably 28 because you have to have a, a college degree and a master's program in order to join the Navy as a chaplain. So, and then, of course, you can also have much older people than that. The Navy was so desperate for Catholic and Jewish chaplains, you could be 60 years old and join the service. So imagine this ragtag, motley crew bunch of chaplains showing up for the first day of boot camp, and they're going to whip us into shape. Well, one day the gunny took us out running, and uh, he just kept running and running and running. Now, in the Navy, uh, your gunny is a Marine Corps gunnery sergeant, uh, and they're different. I swear they're different from a different planet. And when we went out running, he wouldn't stop running. And now a few of us, and that wasn't me, by the way, could keep up with him. Then there was a group of us kind of in the middle of the pack. It's like, okay, we're going to stick together. We're not going to embarrass ourselves. No matter what happens, we'll finish this, even though our bodies are saying we're going to kill you. We're going to stick with it. And then there was a group of people, you know, the... The 60-year-olds, the people that were a little overweight, the people that hadn't run since they were probably 10. And they were at the very back, and they were getting further and further behind. Now, as the more we ran, in our minds, we were thinking, okay, I know what this guy's doing. He's trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, the weaklings. Get rid of them, yeah. And then he starts circling back. And the front group passes us. And so we turn around, we start following. And he goes all the way to the very back and gets in behind the slowest person and starts running again. And we take off. And we, this exercise repeats itself. People start falling out. A little while, he circles back. And we have to come back. And we pick those people up and we keep running. We did this all afternoon. And I thought, what is he really doing here? And after we got back, you know, we were all pretty upset. Well, at least the people that were in the front, well, now I wouldn't even say they were upset because they loved running their nuts. But those of us in the middle of the pack, we were upset because in our minds, we had to keep running because of these people behind us that couldn't keep up. And when we got back to the barracks, it's like, okay, we need to have a talk with them. But before we could, the gunny showed up, and he goes, Now, what did you guys learn today? Now, those of us in the middle of the pack knew better than to hold, raise our hands because, you know, we don't know anything. And he looked at all of us, and nobody had a clue. And finally he goes, Your lesson today was that you don't leave anybody behind. And he goes, My job is to prune you, whip you into shape in order for you to think that way. You don't leave anyone behind. Now, I, I love that lesson because that's one of the core values they teach you in the military. And it's a comforting value because when you're in a war zone, you know that everybody around you is going to make sure you get home. And I just, for me, that was my military experience, this this group of people and I mean in the Navy we pull people from all over the country so you might have a guy from South Louisiana bunking with a guy from the Bronx you might have a girl from sh uh, Chicago hanging out with a girl from California it's black white gay straight they're all there wearing the same uniform running with the same promise that no matter what happens I'll make sure you get home and that love, that bond, if you ever get to experience that, it's, it's very special. And that was a formative thing for me when I went to Iraq, to experience that, 
that love, that companionship, that brotherhood, sisterhood. No matter who we were, in the moment, we were all one. We wore the same uniform. We had the same mission. And we made the same promise. We'll be there for one another. In the scripture today, uh, Jesus is going through you could say the Last Supper. And in John's Gospel, the Last Supper is not a paragraph. It's this extended discussion. First, they're at the dinner table, and they're talking and eating. And then in the passage today, Jesus says at the end of chapter 14, he says, okay, guys, gals, let's get up. Let's be on our way. And they all get up and they follow Jesus out the door. And there's this wonderful scene, and you can almost envision it, where Jesus and the followers are walking through the vineyards. And if you've ever been to Israel, there's vineyards everywhere. There's olive groves. Uh, you know, I, growing up around Cecil, we had Altus, so you could go hike the vineyards. Uh, wherever I go, if there's a vineyard, I love to go hike through the vines. It's just beautiful. It's amazing. And here they are hiking through this, walking through this. And you can almost sense Jesus taking his hands and feeling the leaves as they walk through this vineyard. And then he starts teaching them. He takes that vineyard and he uses it as a, as a metaphor. He goes, guys, gals, God is the vineyard grower and I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, for those of us who have not grown up in vineyards and don't know much about it, for those of us who drink Boone's wine, you know, you just, you probably just don't get it. But in this passage, what Jesus is talking about, what I love most especially is when he calls us the branches. Have you ever seen wild grapes growing? The branches are just tangled and they're wild and they're growing everywhere. And if they do produce any grapes, they're just teeny tiny. They taste like nothing. They're useless. But if you go to a vineyard and you talk to a vineyard owner and you have him explain, how, how do you cultivate grapes? They'll talk about first, you have to start out with that strong vine, which is the main trunk that grows from the ground. And he goes, you have to keep it pruned. Because those branches, if they're not pruned, they just grow wildly and they grow everywhere. And so every year we go and we cut the branches and we decide which ones are going to bear the most fruit and the ones we know that, that are just not going to make it, we just toss them away and burn them. And Jesus is explaining this to the disciples. And if you'll look at the passage six times, Jesus will repeat, in order for you to to bear fruit. John repeatedly emphasizes that. In order for you to bear fruit. And then at the end, Jesus talks about what that fruit is. And I think this is where a lot of Christians quit reading. Because what Jesus says is, here is what I've taught you. Here is the commandment I leave you. You are to love one another just as I have loved you. And when you do that, you will bear much, much fruit. At the beginning of John's Gospel, we're introduced to a theologian, a preacher, maybe even a bishop, a guy called Nicodemus. He's a leader of his particular congregation. Very educated, very smart, and yet he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night because he doesn't want people to know that he's talking to Jesus. Because Jesus is this wild, renegade pastor who's teaching things that upsets everybody. Well, upsets the church folk and the clergy. And Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I know that you're sent from God because of the things you teach, because of the things you do, but I just have trouble grasping it. I just can't take that final step. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, well, Nicodemus, here's the deal. You're going to have to be born again. And, you know, that's one of those 
passages from Scripture that's often misinterpreted. It's almost like a clobber verse. It separates, you know, the wheat from the chaff. Oh, you're either a believer or you're not. You're either born again or you're not. And believe me, as a Methodist pastor, I've been told over and over I've, I've never been born again and obviously don't know what I'm talking about because I'm too liberal or something. But he tells Nicodemus, you got to be born again. You got to let go of your old ways of thinking, your old ways of doing things, and you got to embrace this new truth, this new way of living out your faith that I'm presenting to you. Those rules, those laws, they're just not working anymore, Nicodemus, because they're hurting people. They're keeping people from coming to God, and you need to be born again or to use another metaphor from today, Nicodemus. You need to prune those wild branches of dogma and creeds and theologies and get back to the core message to love one another. And Nicodemus can't do it because, well, quite frankly, he's too well educated. He knows too much and he just can't let go of that and start over again. And he doesn't want to be pruned so that he can bear the fruit of love. And so he slurks away in the middle of the night and he loses out on his chance to encounter the love and the grace of God there's a phenomenon going on in Kentucky this week at one of our seminaries uh, they're calling it a revival and this seminary is at the locus of the new global Methodist church and it's kind of suspicious that suddenly there's a revival breaking out. And they're claiming, you know, thousands of people are coming from miles to, uh, to you know, have their hearts changed and, and God to touch them. And I pray that that's true, but I'm very cynical when it comes to revivals. Because quite frankly, when I look back at the history of the American church, revivals broke out all the time throughout the South. And millions of people gave their life to Christ. And yet, when I think about that, I think of, was it really God? Were hearts really changed? Were attitudes and beliefs really pruned away so that the spirit and the fruit of love could grow? And I'm cynical because I know my history. I know the South practiced Jim Crow, segregation, and white terrorism. And if all those people were going through revival and experiencing God's love, how could they then go out the next week and commit those atrocious crimes to minorities and to people that didn't look like them? And I told a friend of mine, yeah, I'm just cynical. Because, yeah, you can have an emotional event, but does it really change hearts? You know, that first revival in the book of Acts, when the disciples were all huddled in that closed room and the Holy Spirit came upon them, it pruned them and then it sent them out in love. And the church grew by leaps and bounds because they loved everyone. They loved Gentiles and Jews. They loved slave and free. They took care of widows and orphans and the poor. And people flocked for miles to be a part of that group because that was a true revival. Back at the turn of the 19th century, and I've got to get used to that. Now when you say the turn of the century, that's 20 years ago. I'm talking about the one before that. There was a place called Azusa Street and that was where the Pentecostal movement was born. And a revival broke out. In the midst of that occasion, black and white came together and they worshipped together. Men and women came together and worshipped together. And then they went on to do amazing things for the least, the last, and the lost. And to me, that's a true revival. When we let the Spirit of God and the Spirit of love break down all the boundaries that separate us and unite us as one. When Jesus says he is the vine and we are the branches, he's talking about if we want to bear fruit, we have to start learning to love one another again. 
And I know that's a cliche and you can almost slap that on a bumper sticker and it's utterly meaningless. But the older I get, the, the harder I realize it is to love one another. I hardly like myself at times. And I'm called to love everyone. You know, we Christians, we, we act like it's just easy and it's not. Jesus told us in the book of John that we are to be as one and yet as we as Methodists, we're splitting and we're causing division and disunity and that's just wrong because we haven't allowed God to prune us so that we could bear that fruit. So when you read this passage and Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, what we need to be challenging ourselves with is this thought. We probably need a good pruning. We need to have our branches cut away so that the fruits of the Spirit can grow and flourish. And it means facing those hard truths that we, as individuals and as churches, we're going to have to change. We're going to have to let go of things in order to fulfill what Jesus told these disciples to do, to love one another take care of one another what does pruning look like to you I think in this new 21st century it means letting go of a lot of beliefs a lot of dogmas a lot of creeds a lot of doctrines because I see theology getting in the way of us loving one another I see theology as blinding us to the needs of others because we're too busy defending our beliefs and we're ignoring the hurt and the suffering that's going on all around us. Christians will go thousands of miles to, to lead someone to Christ, but we won't open our pocketbook to feed the hungry or to clothe the naked or to house the homeless. Churches are some of the most stingiest groups in our nation, spending all the money on their buildings and their worship and hardly anything on mission and changing lives. There's something wrong with that. When the four walls here are more important than all the strangers out there. Because we're not simply called to love one another. We're called to love all those people out there. And believe me, that's hard enough. I don't have time for theology because I need to learn how to love just as Jesus loved because I want to bear those fruits like Jesus taught me. So I challenge you this week. If your theology, if your Christian beliefs are getting between you and loving this world and the people in it, you need to be pruned. And that's a hard reality to face. And I hope we won't end up like Nicodemus and saying to Jesus, I just can't do that because my theology is more important than the God who calls me to love one another. May we pray. Father, Help us to love one another. Not in that superficial way, but in that way that you taught us. That we could be the hands and the feet of Christ, ministering and nurturing others. That we could see in the eyes of a stranger, a brother, sister in Christ. God, in this world where there are so many divisions and so much demonization and hatred, Teach us to love again. Teach us to embrace all the world's people as your children. And help us to love sacrificially. And help us to love the way Christ taught us to love. In your holy and precious name, amen. During communion, I invite you to remember your baptism when God poured out his love upon all of us. As you come forward, simply dip your hands in the water. 
and make that ancient sign of the cross to renew your walk with Christ, to renew your walk in love. There's a whole world out there waiting on each of you. People who are broken, who are lost, who are hurting, that simply need someone to love them. And when we leave this place, that's when the real work of the church begins. When we're able to love unconditionally, without judgment, without condemnation, the least, the last, and the lost. And that's when the hard work begins. But remember your baptism, because that's who we're called to be.